on a routine expedition. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. The choice we're going to mandate should get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for coming, friend. Love that about you, right, Gina Grant? That's right. Handball, Brian. Meh, meh, meh. Two by four. Meh, meh, meh. Plywood. Meh, meh, meh. That's such a good impression. All right. Well, uh, Sid Croft is coming in. Sid of what a day. Sid and Marty Croft. Uh, very interesting story. I was reading up on him last night. Does anyone else have anxiety? Well, I have mixed feelings. <laughs> Well, listen. <laughs> Mostly excitement. Give the devil his due. He's I, a successful man. I have a super cut I've got drawn from over the years of Adam and calling him a hack and, a, and just a, a, a Let, real I do TV. A deep it's, dive on that. It's 28 minutes long, so it's going to take up most of the segment. <laughs> well, um, Sid and Marty Croft, uh, Canadians, mm -hmm. which um, explains something to me because oh. their, their stuff, their comedy was off, <laughs> but they're... Their 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 color palette was interesting. Their costumes, their puppeteers. Yes. In as much as Kids in the Hall was the weird cross dressing version of SNL, it, the best. It, it lines up. Yeah, and it struck me. I'm telling you, when you have when my kids were young, they would watch Caillou, and I would just watch it with them, going something is off. Mm -hmm. And there are <laughs> cartoons that are funny and cartoons that aren't funny, and then there's cartoons that are off. Right. And Caillou was off. Yeah. Um, color palette is weird. Shoes are weird. Ah, Do Canadians weird wear weird shoes. shoes. And uh, they, they also have little, they have tennis rackets on the bottom. Okay. They called every <laughs> yeah for the snow. Yeah. They also they called people by strange titles. Um, everything was off. And then at one point, I realized it came out of Canada. What did they say? Mummy. It was like French Canadian. Okay. And I was like, that's Papa. That's what I'm picking up on, not Hanna Barbera. Right. Hanna Barbera. Some of it's okay, some of it's horrible, but anyway. So, Sid Croft, Sid and Marty Croft, these guys who are Canadians. Um, Sid was born in 1929. Damn. He's 93 years young. Um, he's heard some of my critiques oh, of, his, of his work. You know what? That makes me feel better. <laughs> over the years <laughs> and has decided in true Canadian fashion to come in anyway. God bless this Because he says he's a fan of mine. Now, we'll... We'll see if he is or not. That but after he's heard all the ways you have shat upon he and his ilk, yes. and to say he's a fan, I already love this man. Uh, listen, anyone who wants to come in and mix it up, I, I, <laughs> I, I tip, up I tip my hat to them. Yeah. Now, if he starts getting physically aggressive, Gina, <laughs> I'll you, be in need the middle. To, you need to run interference Don't for worry. me. So um, we have, uh, look, they did all this. They, they were a major part of my childhood. My childhood was Hanna-Barbera and Sid and Marty Croft. Those are kind of what we had. Hanna-Barbera has done their fair share of damage as well with Hong Kong Fooey and Jabba Jaw and all the, yeah. all the Grape Ape Grape and the Hair Bear Bunch. They, they completely copped out and they were hacks as well. They were hacks on the animated side. Mm -hmm. Sid and Marty Croft were hacks on the puppeteer. Live action hacks. Live action hacks. And, you know, they had a big laugh track they would pile in. Many people thought they were experimenting with hallucinogens. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. rap was always yeah. like, these guys must be on something. H.R. Puff and stuff. But they always said, no, we're just weird Canadian dudes. They started off as, he started off as a puppeteer. I like it. He... Did you say, Chris, that he opened for Judy Garland? Let's see. I have it. Yeah. Right here. What are you talking about? Open for Judy Garland. As a puppeteer. I, I got to see this double bill. And oh Liberace wow. as well. Um, Royalty. Oh, my God. I love it. Fast forward a few years was on the phone with Michael Jackson when the uh, first plane hit the tower on 9-11. Oh, that Michael Jackson. That sounds like an ad lib. Yeah. Just crazy or mad. Is it mad lib? Yes, mad lib. Said. Oh, you're putting you, in the crazy words. Oh, sorry. 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 Um, so either way, uh, a, a long and storied and very interesting <laughs> life. But somewhere he got hold of a nine-year-old Adam Carolla. <laughs> and I dutifully watched. Yeah. I watched a Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. I watched H.R. Puff and stuff. I watched uh, Land of the Lost. I watched Lidsville. Oh, right. The singing uh, the quartet with the at the Great America or whatever. The Six Flags. Um, Is that what you're talking about? No, Six Flags in Atlanta or something was where they, I think, where they did 
Um, or the banana something. The banana splits. Sorry, yeah, they right. they were involved with the banana splits. Right. Is as well. Um, interesting stuff that was um, <laughs> visually interesting, but creatively uh, bankrupt. But yeah. but came up with the story of a, a land called Lidsville, where everyone he he fell into the hat of Charles Nelson Riley, who was the. This isn't real. Who was the? Another madman. Screw yeah. this up. He was the Hoodoo Guru or the Guru Hoodoo. That we thought or something. was a band. There is a band called the Hoodoo, the Hoodoo Gurus. Are a band. Yeah. The Hoodoo so Gurus you thought are they got it from this a band, some other... but they got it from somewhere else. But he was the Hoodoo Guru, and a little kid came behind stage and fell into a giant magician's hat, and then sure. fell through a porthole in time, and it ended happens. up in a place where everyone had hats. What a magical uh, land. Is this based on a true story? <laughs> their hats. But I, I will play a clip from my oh. audio book from 2000 and, I don't know, nine, maybe 10. Uh, in 50 Years Will All Be Chicks, uh, where I dress as Sid Croft. Oh, boy. 2010. 2010. I was on the CBS lot last year, and we're walking to the stage where I was shooting my sitcom pilot. Somebody said, there's Sid and Marty Croft's office. Then, with a certain amount of pride, one guy said, Marty's in there. Would you like me to introduce you to him? I said, no. He said, why not? The guy's a legend. I said, a legendary hack. The guy stopped walking. He was shocked. He said, do you know how many shows Sid and Marty Croft got on the air? I said, I know. Believe me. I watched them all when I was a kid. Far Out Space Nuts, Land of the Lost. Nice job with that, Will Ferrell. That was a great idea. Let's take the fucking worst goddamn show of the 70s and uh, make it into a $70 million feature. You're fucking genius. Great job. Awesome job. I'm so glad nobody saw that piece of shit. Sorry, where was I? Obviously, I'm passionate about these two dillweeds. Land of the Lost. Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. Artistically vacant, derivative, hackneyed garbage. Basically, a big bowl of styrofoam packing peanuts that came in a brightly colored box with a shitty prize in it. He said, how can you say that? The guy's a pioneer. He's 85 and still hard at work every day. I said, hard at work doing what? Warming over steaming piles of shit like the aforementioned land of the lost so that a new generation's IQ can be collectively lowered while this imbecile hammers another check? Then he said, why are you so angry about Sid and Marty Croft? I said, because idiots like you are trying to turn guys like these into deities. They're rich. Isn't that enough? They came around during a time when there was no competition and monopolized Saturday mornings with shows like Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. One of the worst shows, nay, one of the worst creative endeavors ever undertaken. And they want respect? I'll give you two scenarios. One is they actually thought they were artists. And that that shit they were crapping out every Saturday morning was good, which makes them delusional hacks. Or two, as I suspect, they knew they were providing shit. They knew the checks would clear and they didn't give a fuck, which would make them evil hacks. Either way, you watch an episode of Far Out Space Nuts and tell me if the label legend applies. If I'm sitting on a lot somewhere 40 years from now, and you go, oh, hey, there's old man Corolla. Give him a ton of respect. He came up with Crank Yankers in the Man Show. And then you go, well, what's he working on now? Crank Yankers in the Man Show. 50 years later, of course you don't have a crate of bone in your fucking body. You're trying to warm over shit that sucked in the 70s. And now I'm supposed to tip my cap to you. Hey, it's Far Out Space Nuts, the movie. It's Sigmund the Sea Monsters movie. And they are going to do those. You know they're going to fucking do those. And those fucking ass wipes aren't even working on anything. Just trying to fucking squeeze a piece of shit to see if they can get another nickel out of it. Fuck you guys. You're rich enough. Go home and die already. Before you poison my kids with your shit. I'd rather have my kids just stare at Christ in urine than fucking hear any grape apes or far out space nuts. They'd be better off. Sid, we're really excited about you coming in. <laughs> we're all I'm looking forward to it. <laughs>
Oh, my God. I'm sweating. <laughs> but he is, uh, by all accounts, uh, a sweet man and, and an accomplished guy, you know. He joined the circus when he was a teenager. He made puppets and he opened for Judy Garland. I'm sold. All right. So we will... <laughs> Hear his long and storied career. <laughs> On the I, Land of the Lost uh, Wikipedia page, the uh, film, there's a section for awards, all Razzies, uh-huh. uh, nominated for eight Razzies uh, that year. Again, there are certain things that we recognize, like Bugatti made all the finest automobiles in the world in the 20s and 30s, and then the Bugatti kind of went away. Mm-hmm. But there's... There's brand value mm-hmm. to it. You go, that's a fine, you know, let's bring back the Bugatti. And now there is a modern day Bugatti making super cars that are of the standard of Bugatti. So I get the part where you go, well, we can do some commerce because people heard of, of this right. Gucci or Bugatti or whatever. There's, there's a place for it now. But I don't get things like malaria and the Holocaust. You know, it's like, yes, there's, brand recognition. Those, there's great brand value there. <laughs> like we, we, instant recognition. Instant recognition. <laughs> and Land of the Lost is, is pretty much instant recognition, except for it's instant recognition of a piece of shit. Mm. And that thus, why are we dusting this off? I'm glad it died a, a thousand deaths. And I know there's a version of this um, – what was there, 21 Jump Street or something, where oh, you, yeah. you just take right. it, you completely reimagine it and make movie. it into something else, and then I don't even know. But at that point, why does it need to be 21 mm. Jump Street? Right. Why can't it be just a funny cop? Name recognition. Name recognition. All right. Uh, in Lidsville, the evil magician was Hoodoo, but not the Hoodoo Guru, okay. played by uh, Charles Nelson Riley, who was, um, by the way, that's Baldwin's greatest... Oh, yeah, he's great. Kills Baldwin that with the, the actor studio. James yeah. Lipton <laughs> as uh, Charles Nelson Riley. First, I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's Will Ferrell and he at the at the height of their yeah. talents, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, so we'll uh, we'll get into that. I have uh, well, quickly we can show you the clip before uh, Michael pops up. Right, he'll tell me, Chris, when uh, Michael pops up. Michael's Schwimmer's uh, thing is kind of. Interesting. I talked to August about it sort of in the airport last week. Um, and I'll let him tell the story. But it's sort of a, and I guess we're going this way. If you're like a phenom athlete and you're 15, and he'll give us the details, uh, they will invest in you. And then yep. if you end up going to the show, they will need to get back some of their investment. It's a reverse but it's, mortgage for minor league baseball players. <laughs> yeah, and I think think um, there might be other sports as well, or at least it'll branch out. So we'll we'll get into that. Oh, now with the new uh, the new NCAA rules, I imagine it's a it's a wide open playing field. No pun intended. Oh, we were right. Like you yeah, pulled yeah. this off ten years ago. We but. were Chris and Mike and I were over watching uh, <laughs> the Hook'em Horns play uh, the uh, Crimson Tide. Which I was just called the Crimson and Tide because oh. I didn't know what the word crimson, crimson. was. What, was what about? Word? What? Wait, that begs the question. What is the word crimson? Yeah, I, it doesn't. It's a good it doesn't. When you're whether it's song lyrics or a team name, when you're trying to make things work in your head, you, th- th- there's not as much thought that goes into you, as you thought. I thought the Nebraska. <laughs> Corn huskers were corn hustlers. Right, because, because you're just I don't trying know to what find a husker is. any word that sounds familiar. That's why in Little League right now, we're teaching uh, the kid boy that it's called an inning and not an ending. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I get that. When you're a child, or in Adam's case, a little older, your brain's like a game of Plinko, right? And like the right. word you don't know. Anything you know, it's you've gotta, heard of. It's got to fall somewhere. But you've heard the song, Mr. Sandman. What did you think of Crimson and Clover? Oh. Tell him that my lonely nights are over. Crimson. Or the Joan Jett mm. song that you love so much. Crimson and Clover. Yeah. Tommy James and the Shandells, yeah. I think, did that originally. The, yeah, the All cover. Right. Michael Schwimmer is up on, We there he is, zooming in. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Big League Advantage, uh, former MLB relief pitcher. Um, where'd you play your ball, Michael? Yeah, I played uh, at UVA in college and then was with the Phillies and the minor leagues for three years, got to the major leagues for a couple of years and then got traded uh, to the Blue Jays before I blew my arm out. And that was that was all she wrote for me. Um, so this idea or this this business, uh, 
big league advantage. Give us a kind of uh, quick elevator pitch of how it works. Sure. So it's an idea I came up with while playing and really seeing how, you know, athletes live and the, it's just, it's really athletics and entertainment. Really. It's the American dream. I mean, when you're starting off, you're not getting paid much, much money and you want to get to the very top where you, you know, really go from the motel six to the Ritz Carlton. Um, and every edge matters, right? I mean, these athletes in minor league baseball, less than 10% of minor leaguers will play one day in the major leagues. And now here we are in the NIL world. It's the same thing with college football players. Less than 10% will play one day in the NFL. Same for college basketball is now the minor leagues for uh, the NBA. And so every little edge matters. Um, it's how I got to the major leagues. I certainly wasn't the most talented. I was probably bottom 10 percentile in terms of talent um, with the Phillies. I was a senior sign. And I had five thousand dollar signing bonus and, you know, kind of said good luck. And so, you know, every Every edge really matters. And I started this company to give players the opportunity, if and only if they wanted to, um, to get extra capital so they can invest in themselves to try to give themselves a little bit better um, edge and advantage to, to get to the peak of their profession. Well, you see all those, not only all the, you hear all the stories of going off, you know, traveling, going out of town, going to baseball camp and football camp and doing all that stuff, obviously, hotel, airline tickets. I mean, it's it's not a poor man's sport and the other thing i keep seeing is these virtual goggles uh, that are advertised <laughs> on tv guys batting oh, yeah. kids batting i mean look we had you know when i was a kid and played little league baseball you were lucky if you found someone that just had that weird tee that you could put the ball on sure. and go down and whack it i i used to have to use i had a couple of home run balls from little league I had to put them in play because we had to use my home run balls to play with because I couldn't afford three baseballs. It's very sand lot of you. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I, you know, a little money, a little training, a little travel would have gone a long way. I'm, I'm fascinated in the business model. I have lots of questions. Number one, obviously, I'm guessing that the athletes can do whatever they want with the money you invest in them. I mean, if they want to pay to rent, because, you know, men, minor league baseball players or college athletes, for example, you know, they're not making much money, if any at all, and they can use the money, I assume, for whatever they want. That's right. The money, there's, you know, the money is theirs. And so the idea is it's a no risk basis, meaning they don't make it to the top of their profession. They keep all the money. In fact, like legally, they could do a deal with us get the money and decide, you know what, I want to quit and become a doctor. The money's theirs. There's no strings attached. Now, if they do get to the major leagues or NFL or NBA and they do make $100 million, let's say, and they do a deal for 1% where they get money up front in exchange for 1%, then they only make $99 million. They don't get the full you know, hundred million. Aww. So that's the, that's the, the idea. That's that was, that was another question I had was, let's say the athlete goes into another field. I assume the, 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 the payout you would get is only invested in their professional salary. Exactly right. So no endorsements, no um, appearance fees, you know, after baseball, if they want to do media, things like that it has nothing to do with any of that. So our deals and our contracts are essentially just money coming from teams in that, you know, as a professional. Would you or is there a model for your business to get into the endorsement side of it so you could maybe the, the athletes who might never see a dime from their, you know, the, the volleyball player, people are going to be Olympians, for example. Granted, that's an even smaller pool, but you could identify the right athletes. Yeah, sure. So, you know, we're a data analytics company. That, that's what we do. We have over 40 people working full time here and we try to model these things out. We feel like we have very unique ways um, you know, to model out which players are going to make it, which aren't, and at what degree. And so we need that type of, uh, you know, data in order to do that. But we've thought about a lot of different industries, whether it's DJs, musicians, mm. uh, comedians, even believe it or not, Adam, you know, oh. you, can, you can do some, uh, you can do some analytics there it and is. see <laughs> you know, what kind of growth and in, on Instagram following how they get their growth, how the shows go, how many people come. There's a lot of different ways you can quantify and try to predict you know, who's going to make it, who's not. And look, the way our business is structured, we're going to lose money 70, 80% of the time. We know that, right? I mean, the athlete or the entertainer, or whatever is going to make my motor the majority of the time. However, we hope, you know, we can make money because, you know, we can only lose one X. We can only lose what we give a person. Um, and we can make, you know, potentially 50, a hundred X if we hit the right, you know, person in there. So that's kind of the business model, you know, that we have. We were talking at this, a little bit of a sidebar, Chris will help me, but, we were at the uh, Alabama-Texas game, and uh, 
Mike August was saying to me, you know, the quarterback, who I guess is a freshman who's starting for UT, uh, that guy should be in high school. And then he said <laughs> they gave him a million bucks or they gave him a million bucks to leave high school. He went to another college. It didn't work out. And then I guess he came to UT. And then one of the guys we're running with who's an expert said, no, no, it's more like four million bucks. <laughs> so can you explain that that process and, and how that process sure. works? That's a totally different process. Nothing to do with us. These are these NIL collectives that are going across, you know, all around the country. Um, and basically what happens is, is, and this is, you know, what's supposed to happen and what's actually happening, right? Um, colleges aren't supposed to have any say at all in terms of, you know, getting the money and going. And so, you know, you see Tennessee, there's a player that's in high school going to Tennessee that was reported to get $8 million over the course of years and obviously to come to Tennessee. But in the contract, it's creatively written where, you know, he doesn't have to attend the university, right? <laughs> um, which, you know, I guess in theory, he could take the money and not attend, but obviously that won't happen. I think you're going to see something, this massive paradigm shift in college athletics. You know, if I'm a college athlete right now, what I'm doing is I'm playing one year as a freshman and then I'm transferring. And after my sophomore year, I'm transferring again. And who's ever going to pay me the most money, right? Wow. Um, mm-hmm. You know, why wouldn't you do that? Now, this system is brand new right now. It's the wild, wild west out there. There needs to be, in my opinion, a lot more regulation around this. Uh, but I also think players should be getting paid more. I think schools should be paying these players. What other industry that, you know, not the, the people that are in charge of making the money get none of it, right? These athletes that are bringing 95% of the revenue, these football players, these basketball players, and they get absolutely zero. Um, and now they're saying it's okay with the NIL. To me, I hope it's just the beginning, but I've always been pro athlete and think that athletes should be able to earn just like, you know, they're just, just like the rest of us in this world. It's a, it's a free market. It's capitalism. It's a system we live in in the United States. And why shouldn't college athletes be able to, um, you know, profit just like the rest of us? Well, the quarterback we're speaking of, Quinn Ewers or something, Ewers. Um, mm-hmm. I think he broke his collarbone in the second quarter oh, somewhere. That's a pricey injury. Yeah, that's pricey. I don't know if it's on his throwing <laughs> side or not. But uh, so back to your business. Um there must be people submitting things to you like, hey, here, let me show you some video of this uh, phenom 15-year-old center fielder put together a highlight reel. You also must have to go out and scout as well. Is it a combination of both? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I played it. I don't think models are the full end-all, be-all answer. Uh, my belief after seeing it from both sides is, you know, I think models should be the base and then subjectivity because there's so much that models can't, uh, you know, pick, pick up on work ethic. Right. Uh, ke- team chemistry, the, a lot of different types of things that I believe matter. Now, I think a lot of teams are run with eye test first and model second. And I kind of think it should be reversed with model first, um, then subjectivity on top of that. Uh, but yours is such a great example. Here's a guy that, you know, we would have a very you know, extremely high offer. We think the, kid, the kid's going to be a special player in the NFL, but you know, unfortunately, it's, sometimes it's difficult to get a hold of players, right? Um, to give them this opportunity um, if they want to do it. And you know, I, I think about something that you had on your on your show, actually a live show, the boss, right? I mean, he was one of the best college football players that you know we've ever seen. And had he done a deal like this, and now you know it would happen to him in the NFL with the injuries and all that stuff, maybe he has millions of dollars now you know, to try to start chapter two of his life, right? Yeah. We were around during that time. I wish so too, because um, I had to pay for his Uber ride back yeah. to his house after the show. And I wish I could have just pointed yeah. at him and said, hey, man, what about all that That's cash right. you made in college? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what else is so great about this, just in terms of like kind of the hope that you give young professionals? How many times are, I do, it doesn't matter if you're in radio, if you're social media, actor, it doesn't matter. All you hear is get back to us when you could do something for us. You know, when you have everything and you've put 100% sweat equity into it, give it to us, we'll take it from you and, you know, we'll pimp you out. And your model is I see something in you before you do. And I yes. think that's a really kind of fun and interesting way to do this. Yeah, it, it's it's look, we, we've signed over 450 players so far, and it's just been it's so cool. I mean, these players are like family, like we're with them, whether they make it. It's a partnership. It's how we look at it. Right. We have so many players that you, know, you can imagine. We have a ton of players that we've invested in that you know never made it. But they call me up. Hey, swim. 
you know, I've got two kids with one on the way. I thought I was going to make it. Mm. You know, I love baseball. What can you do? And, you know, with our investor base, and I really have to thank our investor base. They've been so cool about this. And, you know, they understand that it's a family and, you know, we help them find jobs. Wow. Right. You know, like all, all these kinds of things, because they but now look, we're not going to make a penny from that player. It doesn't matter to us. They're family. <laughs> right. And I think generating that relationship is why we've had you know such a great reputation and why, you know, players, you know, are are excited about these deals. Now, it's interesting the taking the template and expanding because that's what happens to every company. You know, Amazon starts off selling books online and then they're yeah. this. You know, everything, Netflix. every every company is about yeah. just growth and expansion. And yeah, you could have found uh, a young 18 year old Jewel singing in a coffee house in yeah. San Diego and living out of her car and yeah. got her an apartment. How'd and you like to live out of a better car? Yes. <laughs> You could live out of a Lexus. Yeah. And there's going to be, there's definitely going to be that. I could see that with comedians. I could see it with just about, and, and maybe spread into like, you know, the tech industry, some sure, phenom absolutely. coder guy at 19, who you know is going to take over Facebook in a few short years. The possibilities are endless. I think this is the way of the future. I mean, I think you look at this compared to like student loans and those interest rates and all that stuff that you have to pay no matter what. And, you know, why not have why not have this? We have this gigantic wealth disparity in this country. Now, we have this big group of investors, right, that are willing to take the risk. Right. And if they lose money, they lose money. But at least they're changing someone's life. Right. I mean, and and it can help help you succeed. I think it's a win-win out of member. You know, what if we came to you and you were 25 waiting tables and now you can focus it. on your, co your comedy career. Maybe you get started a lot earlier. Maybe you get success a lot earlier. Maybe you make more money and now we're all part of it together. Yeah. That's kind of what the, at least the idea is. Yeah. We could have gotten my teeth whitened. <laughs> could have taught me how to walk with the proper posture with and ele on elocution. That's right. I would have preferred you got hold of me when I was 17 and sponsored me as a carpet cleaner because yeah. I had a lot of potential a working that, future. working that wand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Brian, what Speak, were you saying? Speaking of risk, well, I, well, I, I imagine you <clears throat> can't get into the business dealing specifics, but are there times or are there things written in your contracts where certain things will disqualify or, um, no motor, Cycle ride. Negate a deal. Yeah. Right. If someone gets busted. Nope. Yeah, really? If someone gets arrested, absolutely. convicted of a crime. Absolutely. Absolutely. We do our due diligence beforehand. So, you know, this is where we have, you know, we've been super fortunate enough to do where teams in the NFL, NBA, and MLB, they're, you know, calling us all the time about information. You know, hey, who do I trade the trade deadline? All this type huh. of stuff. We actually have relationships with the NFL team. You know, our models have been so predictive, you know, far, you know, our models in the NFL, and the NBA are more predictive than the actual draft order. So you would assume like the player <laughs> one is better than player two and so on. Mm -hmm. But our models, it's, it's not no team's fault, right? They don't have this, nearly the budget that we have. They hire a couple data scientists. We have 40 plus people working full time. So we're able to do this, you know, on a full time basis. And so they help us. We help them. Um, and that's kind of our, our basis there now. So that therefore we get information, Hey, you know, this player was you know, accused of a domestic abuse thing. I'm not going to invest in that player. That, 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 to me, that's not, but what if he can, what, what if he can really kick, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's something we just don't cross that line. Now, obviously there's going to be things that go underneath or there's going to be players we invest in that could have issues down the road. Uh, um, you know, that we can't foresee. And that's, that's unfortunately just, you know, the nature of, it. we can't be perfect, but we do try to do our best. What is the average age of the athlete you invest in? So it's about 20 to 21. We won't invest in anybody under the age of 18. Um, so they must be 18 or over. And, you know, it goes, we've invested in a 28 year old before. Um, so it, it, it runs the gamut, but the average is in that 20 to 21 year old uh, range. Yeah. Well, we're, we're definitely getting it. Look, if you saw you're not dipping that low, but if you saw LeBron James at 15, you you know there was something right. something there. Do you invest? In, right. Do you invest in coaches? It's something we are very much looking into. In fact, we have these models. So we have a player level models and team level models. And what we can do with coaches, what we've tried to figure out is, okay, if these let's call it tight ends, these tight ends on our player level models aren't very good, and they're producing tremendously. Well, to us, that means that's good coaching, right? Mm -hmm. Versus you would think like a good quarterback coach is the coach that coached Tom Brady. Well, or is it because he has Tom Brady? Yeah, I he didn't need it. Coaching. 
I want to see if all, all of a sudden Mitch Trubisky has the best year of his life. That's the coach <laughs> I want because, you know, previously yeah, it hasn't been that great. And now someone can turn him around. That to us is a good sign of a coach. Uh, and so we can use our models to evaluate coaching at that level. And we are actively considering that as a next step. Wow. So I think what they're working on is young athletes, mm -hmm aging female broadcasters yeah, yeah. and then possibly <laughs> venturing out into other forms of entertainment. I can see that being a, a windfall. Yeah. Wow. It, 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 it's pretty limitless. I mean, and sort of endless in, in terms of what directions you could go with this. Anything you can do to be successful. You could, it, it, doctors, you know, anyone in the medical field. But I think Michael's point is really well taken, which is we keep, we come up, we're thinking like governmentally and politically, we, we think sort of like in this weird concrete and very old way of thinking, which is, you know, this guy's got money. Why doesn't he kick it down to the poor mom and stuff like that? But I like when innovation and in tech like takes care of right. this stuff. This like here's the problem with the governmental model. The governmental model is the old guys who have the money pay shitload in taxes and don't want to pay anymore and have lobbyists and go offshore and stuff like that. You have to get people interested in making money mm -hmm. who will invest, which then benefits the per poor person, but they're not gr handcuffed by the government. They willingly do this to try to make themselves yes. richer. Like they're just, they have to be incentivized and we don't do that. We're like, do the right thing. Pay your fair share. No, I'm not. I want to keep as much money as I can. But when you can get rich guys to start hand it right in checks for poor guys because they think that might make them richer, yeah. then that's a system that works. Yeah, it's a it's it, still a meritocracy. It, absolutely. You look at every entrepreneur in the world. Steve Jobs didn't start off rich. Jeff Bezos didn't start off rich, right? But what do they do? They got money from investors and in exchange for that money, they give up a future share of their earnings in that area. It just happens in every, you know, aspect of life on that side of it, but we don't dig down to really believe in the in as many human beings as I think we should. And I don't think it's not enough people are given that opportunity and given that chance. And I hope, you know, we're in sports right now. We're only five years into this company. But, you know, as we expand, I hope other companies get into this space. You know, I, it's one of those things. I think it's such a great thing for people that, you know, we encourage other companies, other groups to really kind of come in and help out because I think it's I think it's something that just will help people in general. This is so freaking There's innovative. There's no way that's true. What, what do come you mean? on in, come on in, uh, get in my business. Uh, yeah, but there's enough for everybody. How, there's I seven mean, billion we, people. I'm I'm around. Around. I mean, I'm telling you, we, we, I wish we had the time. Look, if we had the time to do it all, then maybe, but we, we just don't, right? So, like, I mean, the more and the more mainstream this becomes, the better I think it is for everybody. Oh, sure. Well, it's a very interesting, innovative mm -hmm. um, venture, and uh, I'm I'm impressed, and I like it. You know, whether. It is, you know, entrepreneurs working on um, greenhouse gases or mm -hmm. the folks that are underprivileged uh, getting a piece of the pie. I just I want to take it away from the government and I want to give it to entrepreneurs. Michael Schwimmer, thank you so much for joining us and catching us up on this very interesting yeah. endeavor. Uh, I will I'll tell people BigLeagueAdvantage.com is where you can go if you want to find out uh, any information about this endeavor. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. All right, yes. In the world of, like, warmed over movie plots and like you know the only musicals besides Hamilton yeah time. are you know they only care about oh legally blonde but now it's the musical doesn't it feel so good to have a completely out of the blue sky new idea to hear about it being successful I, I agree and it's also one of these things that always kind of drives me nuts which is you know none of us know this business we're not engaged in this business we're not we're not even connected to it in any way but when you hear an idea that makes sense you go oh okay like and you ask a few questions you go, oh well, that's, that's how all. it works and then you go all right that seems like we could get a few folks who need some money some money they yeah. need and not only money they need but they may not make it to the next level without the proper nutrition right. and training and things that other people may have right and then it narrows that gap again you know, if you want to figure out, hey, how do we do? How do we narrow the gap between the haves and the have-nots? Reparations don't really do it. The, anything where you go, here's a check, stay home. That 
that doesn't work. This this does work and in, incentivizes the athlete to take care of themselves, well, yeah. to not get involved with uh, certain things they might want to get involved with, drugs or crime or whatever. And when you think about like an agent, like, hey, I don't want him taking 10%. Well, would you rather keep 100% of nothing? So right. it's like it, it really sounds like a win-win. All right, uh, we'll uh, hit a spot here, namely Simply Safe. Nothing matters more than your safety and the safety of your loved ones. But old school home security companies use outdated technology, overcharge you, and lock you into a multi year contract. That's why I use Simply Safe. Peel and stick, get the stuff up and running in under an hour, order what you need, how many sensors, how many doors, how many windows you need. Uh, 24-7 professional monitoring. Simply Safe's agents dispatch police or first responders the moment a threat is detected, even if you're not home or cannot be reached. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes. It's simplysafe.com slash Adam. Save 20% when you sign up for interactive monitoring plan. And you can uh, get your first month for free. Go to Simply Safe. Just visit simplysafe.com slash Adam to learn more. That is simplysafe.com slash Adam. There's no safe like Simply Safe. All right. Uh, we got a hypothetical sexual question, which I always enjoy waiting. We'll take a quick break. We'll talk to Dan right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. You thought it was Alfred, but it's not. I just had a chance to use the term whip five on myself with a lovely young lady, and she enjoyed it. Thanks, man. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Whip five on yourself. (laughs) By the way, that was not, whipping five on yourself was not part of the zeitgeist back then. You know, it was like spanking the monkey and stuff like that. That's what makes him a genius. That's why. One of the greatest orators since uh, Abe Lincoln, Mm -hmm. the great Bobby Hollander. All right. Well, speaking of Bobby Hollander, Dan, 49 from Florida, has a hypothetical sexual situation. Hi, guys. Hi, guy. You're, when you guys did the Would You Rather One Seven or Two Girls Who Are Combined Ten, I, I spent weeks on that. So I, I loved it. <laughs> Thank but I, you. I came up with a, a, a slight variation, which I found funny. Now, was that, I, I think the combined about, number we went we, to 11. We bumped yeah. it up a little, yeah. We went to an 11. Oh. And okay. it's right. important. Yes. And, uh, and then there was the one. Was it seven? I think it was higher. I think it was. I thought it was 10. an eight or a combined like twelve. Chris will, Chris, Chris will look it up. It's written in a book somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. It's somewhere. But yes, I got it. Mm-hmm. So I have a, uh, a variation that I've been talking about, and my wife won't, wants to shoot me for even bringing it up because. Okay. But it, I keep giggling. So, would you? Ra- what would be preferable? One girl who's a four. Or a 10, but Admiral Levine is in the room. Admiral Levine oh, is in Admiral the room. Oh, Admiral Levine. Admiral Levine. Is just in the room, like just Cox the, style? Yeah, just there. Is he, is he an eye shot? I mean, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, I, People have to look up Admiral Levine, but... Yeah, that's uh, that's that's a boner killer right there. Well, do you have to look at her? <laughs> what I'm saying is, like, you just know if she's there? Admiral Levine, I would, well, first off, Admiral Levine, who was a, a, a boy who became a girl, but still has the boy junk. I don't believe she's in any position to judge. Oh. oh. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't, I don't feel like she's sitting there with a raised eyebrow, like the church lady she's or something. She's not yeah, ooh, so precious. I don't think what so. Isn't that special? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I just don't think she's a judger. Okay. Um you know, I don't know if I'd be able to provide reading material oh. for her. Yeah. Um I would uh I might adjust the position. Uh-huh. A little bit. That's what uh-huh. I'm saying. Can you throw a blanket over her like she's oh, a chair? Right. No, come on. Like a that's canary? A, that's a hate crime. But that's not a reasonable question. <laughs> um, if she remains silent 
I think so. Now, yeah, is she doing play by play or color sing. commentary? Or, or s- has to sing the dreidel song. Right. You could give her like a workbook. I mean, wow. you know, something she could, you know, Mad Libs, something she could do to like keep taxes. her busy. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Yeah. Like one of those adult coloring books. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and and then the other would be, do you say a four? Alone with a four. I think you got to raise the four. four up. I think uh, between the ten and the four. Yeah, I think we, everyone's going. We 10. can look the other way on the admiral. Yeah, I think you'd have to get the four up to like a six. Otherwise, this is very transphobic. But I mean, I can put it to the people, Chris Dawson, Admiral. Uh, <laughs> not really disturbed by the admiral there. Yeah. yeah now that, the uh, more fun. Exhibition. Right. Hey, yeah, 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 go ahead. Can you mm-hmm. that to me? Hang out. Check out how I do things. All right. So the beer sick. of the fridge, bro. <laughs> All right. Chris, the yeah. admiral in the room. I I feel weird saying this, but I'm with Dawson. Um yeah, I'm I'm okay with the admiral in the room. You are with a ten, but if we Who could bump that lower number up to an eight, you may just go. I'll go straight eight without the admiral. See, well, yeah, I'm, 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 I prefer well, the admiral. Is that the question? An eight with or without the admiral? <laughs> no, no, that's not the question. No, no. We're bumping the four up to I an eight. I understand that, but, but the way is, you just said it, it made it sound like that was the question. Yes, well, look, there's there's okay. context, okay. and I try not to you know, don't sift get marred in the details. The, the syllables. What I'm saying is, is the four's got to be bumped up. So That's, six. It might you might have to get to a seven, seven okay. and a half yeah. because four is a no brainer, right? Mm-hmm. And is the admiral there? Is she's uh, the U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health? Is she there in any official capacity? You know what I mean? Like, why aren't you wearing oh, a condom? Yeah, Did yeah, you yeah, wash yeah. your hands? Have you gotten your ba- booster? Like the yeah. like the choreographers that are on set for the sex scenes mm-hmm. in a movie. Mm-hmm. That's a thing oh, now. Oh, in no, a the film, is, like right. a, not in a porn no. movie. No. Right. Yeah. Chore- the choreographers? I, yeah. Whatever they're called. <laughs> um, yeah, I get it. Um, she's there on a on an off day. This is her time. Yeah. yeah. But uniformed. Yeah. Uniformed, for sure. I think sure. that helps. You always don the uniform. All right, so now we bring it up to an eight. Dawson, Admiral, 10, no Admiral, Admiral still eight. doesn't bother me. I, doesn't uh, bother you. You know, I, I, I think I'll just, if a eight and a 10, let's go 10. Let's go big, Admiral. I think he prefers Salute. the Admiral. Hang out. Uh, Chris? I'll do the eight. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking of the eight, at that, eight at that point, too. Yeah. The, eight, mm-hmm. the eight's a no-brainer, Adam. I mean, I'm a 49 year old bald man. The eight would be a no brainer if I don't have it's to do it. It's not. It's not a no brainer for Dawson. He's he <laughs> go for the ten. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll make sure how you get it at ten. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. with an admiral <laughs> in the room. <laughs> yeah, it's with, official. come on <laughs> with a witness. That's right. Because you know, no offense, Dawson, <laughs> but if if you just Who's tell your forget? drinking buddies, guess who was with a ten? They're like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> but if you have the admiral. Uh, a, a, stood at attention in an a, official capacity a decorated admiral who would verify your statement right yeah I feel like an, awesome. I'm, I'm the tomb of the unknown soldier that's there right the right. next game never have I ever is going to be dominated by you right alright Dan uh, I think the consensus is you got to bring that four up to make it a debate you mean yeah. um, I guess four is it, more interesting for me four. if it's a six or above I'm going with the six or above uh Four, I would go with the. I would, I would grin and bear the admiral. Dan's kind of getting at what I was going to say, which is a, a, a seven with the admiral or a four. But I mean, either way, we're bringing them closer together. That's mm-hmm. really a good point. Yeah, I think the book, and I think I've mm-hmm. modified this. The book says uh, one person that's an eight or two that are combined ten, but I think we go two that are combined eleven, right. something like that, and then uh, then it gets interesting. Well, thanks, Dan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for the thought. Not provoking. I love you guys. Love you, man. All right. Let's see. We have um, Chris went and pulled the clip of um, me saying what car the woman's father drove. Oh, the Chevelle? From uh, from the stage, right. yes, in Austin. And uh, nobody really caring. <laughs> Just always and uh, she loves fast cars in football. But she could just be saying that. <laughs> Because I've had a lot of people go, oh, I love cars. They don't know shit about cars. That's just the thing they say. And they love football. 
but they don't know shit about football. But we'll quiz her. We'll figure out what Crystal knows about fast cars and football. Now, I can guarantee the fast car, okay, on prediction, her dad had a Chevelle back in the day, or an El Camino. Those are the two shit cars I wrote. Hey, Crystal. Hello. Hey, girl. Hello. You like fast cars and football? Of course I do. Why do you like, what, what's your favorite fast car? Well, my dad had a 67 Chevelle with a I fucking did. I fucking told you. God damn it. It's funny, too, because her... The fucking said her dad had a Chevelle. I just asked her what she liked about cars, and she went into her dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and no standing ovation. Not even a. Oh, boy. they were over it uh, as soon as it left her lips. I, I can commiserate with you as of this morning. This happened to me, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, my God, this is what he's talking what about. What else was I, I right about? <laughs> so I, a, a dear, uh, a wonderful person over at KFI, Shannon Farron, does the Gary and Shannon show every day. Mm -hmm. And I guess she's in Who's Kansas. She? She, how dare you? So there, she's in Kansas City because she also does Rams coverage. Mm. And she just posted uh, an Instagram story that just said... Wait, Rams coverage? Chargers are playing the Chiefs Thank tonight. you, Chargers. Okay. That's what I meant. Thank you. Oh, okay. And um, she just posted a picture, which I'll show you. Just It just says KC. And it was just a table that you can hardly see, like a plate and a couple bowls. That's all you can see. I private DM'd her and said, which barbecue did you go to? That's my town. I'm guessing Jack Stack by the look of the table. Now, it's you a, can hardly yeah. see the table. Very small. Her yes. answer, yep. That's it. That's it. So I said, Wah. I'm sorry, but for a place I haven't lived in 20 years, how impressive was that? Finally, I got my very. But that, I haven't been to Jack Stack since I was a teenager. Mm, and yes. it was just a, I, I, that's I, the one. Been, we've been it's everywhere. We've never been to that place. Yeah, she should have She should have given it up to you. <laughs> I love her, though. All right. In uh, semi-local news, um, somebody tweeted me that uh, our own governor, Gavin Newsom, is going to finally do something about the crazed oh, homeless yeah. oh, population. Oh, God. And, well, Dawson will give us a heads up. But essentially, the plan of you would like shelter and you would like food that's pretty easy to get someone off the street because you want what i'm selling right you're cold you have no roof above mm -hmm. your head and you're hungry so i will give you a place that has a roof and has beans and you will follow me but it does not work for the crazed or the junkies right. or the both right. because they're not interested in the roof and the beans they want the drugs or they're psychotic so at some point this must be factored in mm. It's the assumption that all who are homeless want to get off of the street is a very flawed assumption if you if you look around. But there's a new, I don't know, is a new bill he wants to pass? Oh. Yeah, uh, it won't go into effect until next year. California Governor Kay's mental health courts for homeless with more than 100,000 people living on California streets. Governor Gavin Newsom signed a first-of-its-kind law on Wednesday that could force some of them into treatment as a part of the program he describes as care but opponents argue is cruel. Opponents. <laughs> Wait, we should just call this the Dr. Drew bill, because isn't this what he asked yes. for? Yes, well, I mean, yes. He's now getting into the true face of the homelessness, uh, the true story, the real face of homelessness in Los Angeles and California. Sorry. Newsom signed the Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment Act. It would let family members, first responders, and yeah. others ask mm -hmm. a judge to draw up a treatment plan for someone diagnosed with certain disorders, including schizophrenia. Those who refuse could be placed under a conservatorship and ordered to comply. Right now, homeless I, people... I, first off, I don't... exactly what Drew said. I don't like the acronym shit. Oh, um, really? I, I, the reason I don't like it is zippy. because it, it feels like you spent a little too much time oh, okay. and you're trying to... Look, I don't like the inflation reduction bill yeah, right. because uh, you're euphemistically calling it something that it's not doing and now I'm, I worry. Right. Like, I wonder, what are you really doing? I... I would do a bill that just spelled out felch. <laughs> and then people go, you know what that smells? I go, that's how good this bill is. Yeah. Right, like Smuckers. This Smuckers of Bill. <laughs> that's right. It's how fucking confident I am. I don't euphemistically need to put some acronym together. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Right now, homeless people with severe mental health disorders bounce from the streets to jails and hospitals. They can be held against their will at a psychiatric hospital for up to three days. But they must be released if they promise to take medication and follow up with other services. The new law would let a court order a treatment plan for up to one year. 
wow. which could be extended. For All a right. Second here. He, he, the point is, is nine years ago, we sat in here and I told him who the homeless were. And he explained to me, not only was he numero uno in this this subject, this is what he cared about the most. But there was another homeless group. Mm. And I, it's 40 seconds. I, we have to hear it again because this is him. That was my issue, homelessness, and my passionate efforts yeah. to deal with homeless. I That's an issue that no one cares about in this yeah. country. I care deeply. Well, listen, I, 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 the thing about homeless people is they're either junkies or they're crazy or they're both. This notion of, like, the guy's a hardworking, God-fearing family member who lost his job and now had to take to the streets is total nutter Yeah, bullshit. but what about the picture of real fa- homelessness, which real. is a poor mom with two kids with a husband who took off and left her, who's sitting there struggling on that minimum wage job, and all of a sudden now is out in the streets and sidewalks desperately all right, all right. trying to That's find That's not the real you know, face. Like that that, that's that's nothing. It's, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And now you know it doesn't exist. I'll, unfortunately, we had to wait several years, but... That person that he described as the true face of homelessness does not exist. So no. that person, the full-time minimum wage mother with the three kids, has, is living at her aunt's house in some other part of the country mm-hmm. or is, is, is on somebody's sofa riding it out. That's yeah. what that person is doing. And we're in L.A. every day. That's not something I've seen. Well, think doesn't about exist any kind of statistically significant. Right. Way. Think about the concept of sleeping on pavement in one of those areas, one of those trash heaps we've seen underneath the freeway off ramp or something. Think about the notion of doing that sober. Like, let's oh, just boy. say there were no drugs. I've slept in a driveway. <laughs> Oh, yes. Slept. I was in high school. I was drunk. I was overserved by my buddy who lived That's up the right. street. I passed out in a garage. Yeah. yeah. I you slept, slept on right sand. On floor, I yeah. slept on sand in Tijuana. I slept in an alley in Tijuana. And I slept on a box ring behind a party in an alley once, many years ago. Stone cold sober, right? Will not eat them on a boat. <laughs> but what sober person says, now I think I shall catch some Z's. Let me lay my head down on a pine cone and pull up the sports page. Take up some of my permanent residence on this corner. Don't mind that rat or those roaches. Yeah. I'll just go to bed for the evening, sleeping on a slab of concrete with gum stuck to it. It, it's so it's it. unthinkable. It's, yeah, it's it's not. It doesn't exist. Right. So, at least we understand part of that now. I never knew why there was such a battle. And by the way, you don't need to be Nostradamus. You just drive around. <laughs> it was ten years ago. I said to Gavin Newsom, "It's it's junkies and it's crazy people. Those are those are the people. You got to then approach it to that problem because you're building miniature houses mm-hmm. and stuff. That's that's not right." Yeah. That's not what they want. Well, and then again, to, to flip it even another direction, you're saying that by saying they don't exist, they don't matter. We don't see them. Right. They, they don't count as people. So who are you helping? And Dr. Drew could have been on the city council this two years idea. ago. <laughs> We're doing this, but they would have none of it. And then, of course, the L.A. Times has to do a hit piece on Dr. Drew. I soon I look I I get the LA Times like I get you're progressive and you're left leaning. What does letting people junkies expire in the street have to do with being democratic or left leaning? There's just Don't souls, you want to help people? T- people? souls are perishing in the street. Why why can't Languishing. you be for that? Don't they deserve a second shot at life? No, we don't like Dr. Drew. So blah 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 okay. blah. Yes. All right. You know what the silver lining is? Gavin Newsom's a smart politician. He knows which way the wind blows. This would have been impossible five years ago even, you know, mm. recently. And the fact that he feels brave enough to promote this as a bill or to oppose us or whatever, it feels like the tide is turning in the right direction. Yeah, because you can only step over so many homeless people right. before yeah. you get the public on your side. But the other side <laughs> is... is these super loud homeless advocates who want people to languish in the streets. Oh yes. He has autonomy. He can shit wherever he wants and slam as much heroin as he wants. Like, but is he free? We should have never listened to the home. There were eight homeless advocates. We should have never listened to them who, by the way, anointed themselves (laughs) experts on the homeless. I, I don't even know how they became experts on the homeless. By the way, 
if in fact you were a homeless person for a bit of time, that doesn't make you an expert on homelessness. It makes you an ex junkie because every single, all you have to do is interview anyone who was homeless and they tell you about how they struggled with drugs. Right. So is a picture starting to emerge? I don't talk to ex homeless people that worked full time minimum wage jobs and got divorced. My hunch is that these people get away with it by calling themselves advocates as yes. opposed to experts because then they get away with spouting any, any amount of bullshit. Right. All it's, right. It yes. also should be said that I, d- I did say that this doesn't start until next year, but next year by October, it would only start in seven counties. That's Glen, Orange, Riverside, San Diego, San Francisco, Stanislaus, and Tuolumne counties. Uh, all other counties, including Los Angeles County, have until December 1st, 2024. What the fuck? <laughs> it's only We're the only worse. county that really needs it. I know. And it's going to get worse between now oh, and then. Boy. All right, let me tell you about Geico. Do you own, do you rent your home? Well, you do one or the other, unless you're homeless. You work hard, and you know what's easy? Bundling your policies with Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to worry about around your home. So go to geico.com and see just how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico. Dot com today. All right, Sid Croft. Oh, Yay! A, a meeting, a, a destiny. Yeah. It started in 1974. And, 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 and in a few short moments, we shall talk to Sid Croft of Sid and Marty Croft. And we'll do that right after this. The Adam Carolla Show presents Sid Croft's birthday cocktail party for July 30th. Let's see who's invited. Hey, look who's here. It's Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, sister, Maria Anna Mozart. The author of Wuthering Heights, Emily Bronte is here. Automaker and the namesake of the Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford. Former Major League Baseball Commissioner, Bud Selig. Let's welcome blues guitarist, Buddy Guy. Hollywood actor and all-around creep, Peter Bogdanovich. A slightly less creepy crooner, Paul Anka is here. Jimmy Cliff joined the party. Sly's brother, Frank Stallone. Let's welcome Delta Burke, Bill Cartwright, Kate Bush, filmmaker Richard Linkletter, actor Lawrence Fishburne, former groundling Lisa Kudrow, Vivica A. Fox is here. Terry Crews joined the party. Filmmaker Christopher Nolan. Tom Green. Hillary Swank. Swank. And, ah, I get you, Cohagen. It's not a tumor. Arnold Schwarzenegger is back. Sid Croft is on the Adam Carolla Show. Sid Croft. Hey, thank you, thank you. Co-creator of Land of the Lost, Sigmund and the Sea Monsters, The Banana Splits, Adventure Hour, The Brady Bunch, Variety Hour, H.R. Puff and stuff. It's uh, ubiquitous, part of my childhood. And yes, I've attacked you openly many (laughs) times. But but you you want to know something? Hmm. Adam, Hmm. I absolutely love it. I'm 100% on your side. (laughs) And if you give me a minute... Uh, because uh, I'm I'm thrilled that this is like an hour show. Mm-hmm. I got more than an hour. Oh boy! Yeah. Well, because- I should I should say that I've been invited on your Instagram show Sundays with Sid, and new episodes are 3 p.m. Pacific time on Sundays, and I would be more than happy to attend. Well, I've had a lot of big stars on. I've been only on for two and a half years, mm-hmm. and uh, you know we got our star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And uh, and a lifetime so, achievement award for oh, yeah. the daytime yeah. Emmys as and well. And I don't want I don't want to I'm not on an ego trip, <laughs> but I got to tell you, there were 900 people in Hollywood. It blew me away. I couldn't believe it. You know that all those people came to see us. But you know, get get the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The star. Fame. The star. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, I've been around a long, long time. Uh, There's 30 years before Puff and stuff and all that stuff. Because maybe this is something that 
your viewers or your listeners don't know. Uh, and that's why I went on Instagram to tell my story because they only, you know, know all of our shows. We did 26 television series and 22 specials. And I know, I got to tell you something, Adam, I know millions of people watch you and listen to you. I'm one of them. Oh, oh yeah. Wow. And I have oh, heard. Racist. And I know. <laughs> hey, Adam, I've heard uh, many things where you just ripped us another you know what. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm telling you, 100%. I'm with you. And well, what does that I, mean? What does why. that mean you're I, with me? Well, I, I uh, the things that you said, I have said. And, you know, people, I, I, I got to just go back. You got to give me a minute. Because I said 30 years, I just met you for the first time. And uh, I'm, I apologize, I lied. It's 29 years mm. now that I think about it. And I, I started as a performer. And yeah. I know, and I know, Adam, that uh, you did a, a puppet show. Oh, oh true. Yeah. I forgot Remember about that? Shared love of puppetry. Uh, okay, oh, but yeah. wait a minute. That's how I started. Well, as a puppeteer. Well, let's talk about that. You guys grew up in Canada, born in Canada. You uh, took off with the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus at some at age sixteen. No, I was fifteen years old. Oh fifteen. Yeah. See you now you're alive. Circus. Now you're alive. <laughs> yeah. And what was your act with Ringling Brothers okay. back in the day? I got to tell you something. Um, the first time that I saw a puppet show or a puppet act. It was at a vaudeville theater in Providence, Rhode Island, because in 1938 was the first time that our, my whole family came from Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were in a huge hurricane on the East Coast, and everybody on our street didn't make it, but only our family. And so uh, we lost everything. I don't come from a family that, uh, knew shit about uh, show business. What did your they dad? What did your dad do? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you know uh, that's a whole other story. But his he profession, wasn't, he wasn't in show business. No, no, definitely not. Mm -hmm. And uh, because in 1938 uh, the war started, and uh, and my dad used to import grandfather clocks and he would go from house to house and sell them for 75 bucks and make five bucks for each clock but he'd come back every week he would put it in your house free and then every week he'd come back and collect a buck until you know and that was in uh in boston and providence before we came to america okay but that has, uh, let's get into show business. Uh, yeah, people should know, um, Sid and Marty Kropp, you know them from Land of the Lost and Sigma and the Sea Monster and stuff like that, but I forgot that you guys produced a lot of shows. Um, Richard Pryor had a morning yeah. What? Show in '84. We were talking about Barbara Mandrell we and were? the Mandrell sisters the other day. The guys produced that. One of the most insane <clears throat> variety shows ever created. Brady Bunch. Pink Lady and oh, Jeff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Jeff. Jeff oh, yeah. Altman was a yeah. young stand-up comedian. He, he was the guy who would always be on Letterman going, big, beefy butt steaks yeah. with his, yeah. his thing. And then <clears throat> Pink Lady... Two Korean Japanese No no Japanese Japanese women who speak couldn't a speak word English. Of English. Who spoke no English. Nothing. Nothing. Oh I like you 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 say what you want about Sonny and Cher, but they, they spoke the language. Wow. Yeah. Jeff Altman was sandwiched between two women who did not speak English and they're doing a variety show. Do you want to know something? That show is in a time capsule right now as the worst show ever. 
Which is great. You know, <laughs> what an achievement. Uh, huh? What an achievement. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It, it is a lifetime achievement. I watched it? the shit out of that. I mean, it was probably no, one was, season, uh, right? Yeah. How did that show come about? And we're going to okay. bounce all over the place. Okay, but how do you we get are. Jeff Altman you, to do. Fred Silverman, you know, was our hero. Fred Silverman, we were on children's television. He headed up ABC? ABC and NBC. Right. He was a big, big executive. Okay. We delivered Puff and Stuff just to get back to Puff and Stuff. I was, after we did that show, uh, the first show, I, before it aired, I personally, because I created those shows, I personally just, I was shitting in my pants because I thought, wait a minute, 8 o'clock in the morning, that's all preschool kids, uh, and, whoa, it's like, uh, you know, it, it wasn't about drugs. I wrote Puff and stuff. That came from Puff the Magic Dragon. That was the big hit. And HR you know, everybody thought was hand-rolled, and maybe it was, and maybe it was. Because, come on, we're talking about the psychedelic... I know. Let me see how much of that theme song I can sing. <laughs> HR, puffin' stuff, who's your friend when things get rough? HR, puffin' stuff, can't do a little because you can't do, do enough. enough. Right. Wow. Uh, that is so cool. And then it went into a whole part where him and Freddie were sailing <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. on a boat and they landed and on an a, island uh, and he had a flute that could talk to him. It could have been a bong. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Max Munchnik always thought it was, uh, well, I can't say. Sure yeah. you can. No, I can't. <laughs> yeah, he thought it was a little phallic symbol. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Freddie was a talking flute. flute. Sure. And okay. Witchy Poo wanted the flute. She was obsessed with the flute. You know where that flute. all came from? I know we're talking in big circles, but mm. Fred, just to get back to Fred Silverman, mm-hmm. Fred Silverman was the head of programming. They were scared to death because we had already done only the costumes for the banana split. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And right, and so, uh, and we came through. We delivered because if that show didn't make it, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Side it, sidebar for banana splits, yeah, uh, right. which I could easily sing the theme for as well. <laughs> Tra la la la. All right, the banana splits was the they there was interstitials with the banana splits, mm-hmm. and then they would throw. To filmed things, right? They had Danger Island. They had the Arabian Nights. Wow, you are. So That's all I had. That's really? all I had. I didn't have parents. I didn't have books. I didn't have food. I just had a black and white Zenith TV. I would sit rotting in a decrepit house in North Hollywood. That's all I have. And there were weird battle cries. I haven't heard any of this in, in a million years. So the banana splits would, would run around and they'd do all this stuff and they'd be in their set and then they'd throw it to Danger Island. And Danger Island was some weird dubbed shot in uh, you know, Puerto Rico or something. There was a kid named Chango. And they'd go, uh-oh, Chango! And then I would yell, uh-oh, well, Chango. And then and then there was Arabian Nights where the guy was animated. And the guy goes, size of a camel! And he put his wrists together and he turned into a camel. What the hell? Okay, where did that wait shit a come from? Uh, that was Hanna-Barbera. Han- See, where was Chango? Uh, where, 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 where was Danger Island? Somebody no, went and filmed on. that. that yeah. How? Uh, that's fifty-five or more years ago. Hey, Adam, you don't and, remember and, where that, any of that. I shit remember came from. Everything, <laughs> everything. But Hanna Barbera you know, did did that. You did the outfits. This is what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, we had what we called the show business factory. We had puppet shows in all the Six Flag parks. We were, I was, the creative head of all the Six Flag parks because we had a puppet theater for the Coca-Cola company. We were there for nine years. The show would change every year, and we were the number one attraction. So what I'm really getting to, and I'm not on an ego trip, 
Yeah. But well, you physically well, made those outfits at the beginning? Yeah. And sewed uh, them you, and you know why? Assembled them. Well, we had a big factory. We had two hundred and fifty people. It was like a Disney operation with every department, with a huge art department. And that was my office. I was with the artists all day long. And so what happened was when we finished building all this stuff for Six Flags, I didn't want to let my creative people go, uh, my brother and myself. So we opened up our doors. Six Flags, they financed this for us. We were right behind the Burbank Airport, a city block building, huge, with puffing stuff up on the top, lit up. Okay, because that was our, our symbol. Oh, okay. so, 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 Quick question, just because yeah. my mind's all over the place. In a world where, you know, Michael Jordan's rookie jersey is mm-hmm. fetching, I think Kobe Bryant's is one for 2.3 million bucks. They're always telling someone's shoes mm-hmm. or this is the Raiders are lost our well, nostalgia. Pistol. Yeah. You know, I mean, puffing stuff, there's got to be some rich ass tech guy who would pay if that, does any of that stuff exist? It all, we have a huge warehouse. Yeah, a lot of it does. We had a big auction because my brother and myself said, hey, before we leave the planet, and by the way, I'm 93 years old. (laughs) Yeah, right now. And I'm still working. All right. And I'm working on a huge, huge project with David Copperfield right now. It's Mm going to blow the world away. I mean, we've been on it for a year. We're ready in two weeks for the world to... Where's that? Where will we see that? Las Vegas. Yeah. So he's going to do something big. No, he already has a show there. He's had it for 40 years. Uh, David Copperfield has an island. He's on his island right now. David Copperfield performs three weeks, then he goes to his island, and then he comes back for three. He works seven days a week. When he's working. sold out 40 years. But can you tell us about the project he's you're working on? He's going to make the no. sea monster disappear. Mm-hmm. No, shit, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Uh, all right. But, hey, you know what? Are we making any sense? Yes. 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 We are? We're, we're, we're all okay. over the road, but okay, we're on the road. Okay, wait a minute. Because my mind is clear. <laughs> To go back to Fred Silverman. Mm -hmm. So when we delivered, and when that show went on the air, after it went on the first show, the Beatles reached out to us because of Jack Wilde, you know, being in Oliver, being uh, nominated for an Academy Award. He played the lead in H.R. Puffins. I found him. He's a little English guy with a page boy. I found him. I found Witchy Poo. Or Cheru- Cherubic. Yeah. yeah, who was Witchy Poo? Uh, 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 that was uh, Billy Hayes. Yeah, so. And that's another story. And there's get, Charles Elson. Too many I stories. want Pink Lady hey. and Jeff stories. You got <laughs> Chris. Find, <laughs> find Pink Lady and Jeff just so no, Brian and like, Gina can freak out. No. <laughs> that was the worst. <laughs> the worst show because. Before it went on the air, it was Fred Silverman that saw those two girls in Japan. And, and Fred came to us and said they are huge, bigger than the Beatles. They're like a lounge they, act in oh, Japan. They weren't. Okay. They played stadiums. Oh, yeah, sorry. You know, 100,000 people. And the poor things, you know, couldn't speak a, a word of English. when they, they flew them in. They came into our office. And my brother, you know, he's worse than me. He never shuts up. (laughs) And he was talking to them, and they were bowing and bowing. And then at one point he said, do you understand anything that I'm saying? And they just shook their head (laughs) no. And we knew, and, and Fred Silverman gave us four weeks because he had a, an hour spot, and he knew because we came through with Donnie Marie. He wanted Donnie Marie. I said, Fred, <laughs> let me do a show that the next day, everybody at the water cooler is going to say, holy shit, did you see that last <laughs> night? 
I said, let me, I want the show to come out of a little tiny box. I want it to be so weird. He said, no, no, give me Donnie Marie. You know, I want to have Sid Caesar on the first show. He wanted big in scale. Well, it wasn't that. But there, we never had a big budget. You know, when you... When Where you did ha- you get Jeff Altman? Who was- that was Fred's idea. Fred, Chris will find the opening yeah. or the promo to it or something. It, it's mind blowing. I watched. No, it. it's like it's it's in a time capsule. Come on, <laughs> and we don't even know where it's buried somewhere in Hollywood. So two hundred years from now, they're going to say, "What the fuck?" It'll be exalted. Yeah. This yeah. is what they love. Yeah, here's the twenty yeah. second promo I'll of it. it. <laughs> Sumo yeah. wrestler comes out of the hot tub. I should be arrested for that. <laughs> I really should. I was 11 going, what the fuck is this? You know, I had the head writer on my show, um, my Instagram, and I said, who came up with the hot tub? That was the worst fucking idea. And he said, you did. (laughs) So, oh, God, no way. Well, I was just trying so hard to make that show work. And we had huge guest stars. Oh, so but those shows would get... John Wayne and Sammy Davis Jr. Oh, yeah. and oh. Frank Sinatra and Elvis. They just come walking out yeah. in the middle of the show. Dean Martin, you know, here he comes. Like, you could just get any mega celebrity. You know why? I got to tell you why. Let's go back. When I did my act, I, I knew that puppets were for little kids. And I'm young. And I knew... Gee, how can I, just like my shirt, how can I stand out, you know, and be different? And I'd love to bring it into the adult world. I don't want to have, you know, anything dirty. That wouldn't go. But it's just like David Copperfield took magic because he was a ventriloquist. Did not know that. Yeah. And, and, And he'll tell you that he really sucked. <laughs> at being a ventriloquist because his mouth, you know, uh, opened bigger than uh, uh, Edgar Bergen, you know, <laughs> was a really bad ventriloquist. But Yeah, but he so, did ventriloquism so, on the radio. On radio, so nobody saw it. Are you yeah, kidding? Yeah. No, I'm not kidding. Oh, okay. Edgar Bergen did yeah. ventriloquism oh, on the radio. On Sunday night. The whole United <laughs> States. Candace Bergen's dad. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Executed. All of the United States. That would be like Ed Sullivan. Bigger than Ed Sullivan. Was there at least like a giant audience he was playing to in house? Huge. Okay, so somebody huge. was seeing this. Yeah, huge. Wow. His characters. And uh, in 1937, he introduced Mortimer Schnurd. And my parents loved that name, and they really, Marty's name is not Marty, and they named him Mortimer after that <laughs> wow. that, that character. Marty's okay. f- seven years younger than you are? Yeah, whatever. Something. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and I know you were on the lot. I haven't been there in a zillion years. So, CBS. So, yeah, so when you said... You went into the commissary and yes. you weren't sure if you met me. You never met me before. Oh, I met your brother. Yeah. I met somebody. You're, what a lucky guy. <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> okay. We have the hot tub clip from uh, Pink Lady. Oh, oh yeah. God. If, uh, Show if the hot tub. Chris <laughs> has it. It was mind numbing. Yes. It, uh, imagine Jeff Altman. If Jeff Altman didn't turn out to be a. I had great him on my comedian. show. You know what he is right now? A He's rancher. A, no, a magician. Oh, because oh. he. Yeah. Do you a, remember him um, from Letterman? No. Mm-mm. Oh, he was great. His act. Hey, hey Leno, what was his bit? Let me do this thing on time. He, he pull his pants up high. And, yeah. he, he pull him up. And like, I'm your father. He, he pull my <laughs> pants. Yeah, the tagline. This ta- tag, was, the tagline was uh, big, beefy butt steaks. Huh? Oh. Mm-hmm. He went. Mm-hmm. 
And he's no, like, yeah, pull problem. my pants up. Okay, and, the pants uh, and then, you know, <laughs> your dad. And then he'd yell, big, beefy butt sticks. You know, <laughs> that kind of voice. And uh, I mean, people loved it. They oh, loved they the, loved him. The big, yeah. beefy butt steak. Was that, that was his thing? Yeah, yeah. But they didn't love him on our <laughs> show. Nobody watched our show. you got to yeah. find Altman on Letterman doing big, beefy butt steaks, yeah. too. Yeah. All right, this is, uh, this is Jeff. Oh, what is he, 28? During uh, this, yeah, he's some, yeah, yeah, he's a he young was comedian, really and, young. and he's hot. I mean, yeah. Fred Silverman finds him at the comedy store. All right, here yeah. he is. Yeah, this was one. Fred of Silverman was fired for that. No, he <laughs> wasn't. But you know how Donnie Marie happened? Yeah, no, tell me. Okay, Donnie Marie. Fred saw Donnie was a bit, a huge teeny boppy star. Yes, and she was fifteen. Mm-hmm. And she already had one single. Paper roses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Paper and they were on. <laughs> oh, how real those roses hey, th- You know, you don't sing well. Uh, <laughs> well, you know I'm doing mean? it like Marie. If you yeah. wanted my voice, yeah. I'd yeah. be knocking your socks don't off right now. Don't give up your day job. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, Fred Silverman saw them on a, I don't know, who was the talk show in Philadelphia? Mm. Remember that? Famous Philly native, son of Philadelphia. I never yeah. knew where anything was. I would watch. No. Mike, uh, there was Mike, Mike Douglas. Douglas. Yes. Philadelphia. Oh, there right. you go. I'll take some credit. So, I didn't know yeah. he was out of Philly. So Fred called me and said, I saw these two kids. I'm going to send the tape over. And I, I want you to see this. We were only on kid shows. We... Never did a nighttime show. As a matter of fact, everybody out there, we didn't know shit about even producing a show. Puff and stuff, we did it at Paramount in a sound stage next to Lucy, you know, <laughs> and the Brady Bunch. They, I've they seen the cr- plaque. Yeah, um, they were across the street. The okay. Godfather 2 is two yeah. stages yeah. down. So anyway, um, he said, take a look. I took a look. I called him right back. I said, Fred, you saw me with Judy Garland at the Greek theater. I, I was on tour with her, her opening act, her whole national tour, first Was tour. she difficult? Oh, that's another show. Well, okay. write it down, Jim. Yeah. I have to know. <clears throat> we'll get okay. into that. Uh, All right, but love keep going her. with Fred. Okay, I'm going with Fred. So I said, okay, Judy Garland, you saw me. I worked with uh, Mickey Rooney. I was on tour with him in Vaudeville because I was in Vaudeville, Burlesque, uh, the, the Circus. Hey, Ringling Brothers Circus, not to get off track, the Big Top sat 15,000 people. Wow. We played where the Grove is for two days. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, and. And uh, we did 30,000 people a day. I was in the freak show, in the sideshow, as the world's youngest puppeteer. Another <laughs> really weird, weird story. The, the strangest part Marvel of my whole life. Marvel at the boy. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, I said, hey, Fred, uh, Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland in the 40s, they were the boy and girl next door. They did Let's Put On a Show. I said, Fred, that's who Donnie and Marie are. And he said, bingo, let's do it, let's do it. So he said, in two days, would you fly to Provo and show them a rundown? I said, shit, you're only giving me two days? And you know, the opening, if you remember, it was all ice skaters. Yes. Remember that, not dancers? Yes. Well, next to Radio City Music Hall in 1949 was Center Theater. It was the sister theater of Radio City. And Sonia Henney, for nine years, had her huge spectacle. Famous and, ice skater. And yeah. every year they would change, you know, and I was there the last year. And I went from making $50 a week in Ringling to making $125 a week. Chorus, there were 150 people in the show, but Chorus got $35, even on Broadway in those days. That's what Chorus would would make. I can sing 
I'm a little bit country. I'm a little bit rock. Oh, that'd and roll. be great. Yeah. I'm a little, their, their whole, I think every show they would do. Oh, it. oh, yeah. Chris, you can find it. It's Donnie, who was uh, rock and roll. Oh, sure. And she was country. She was country. And then she'd go, mm-hmm. I'm a little bit country. And then he'd go, I'm a little bit rock and roll. Got a little bit of something Nashville. And then he'd go, a little bit of Motown in my soul. Don't know if it's good. Then it's coming together. Don't know if it's good or bad, but we know we love it. So I'm a little bit country. Cultural and I'm a little bit yeah. rock and roll. And then they would license some Jimi Hendrix song or something. And he'd do some peppy version of All Along the Watchtower or something. It, what? With all due respect, no one has more less Motown soul than Donnie. <laughs> well, well, Donnie's is still in Vegas. You know, I had I'm him on my show. Talented. I've had a lot of huge stars. You know who reached out just a couple of weeks ago is uh, uh, Katie Couric. Oh, my. She watches my show. And so does Anderson Cooper. We will play, uh, yeah. play a, I'll just okay. see how close oh, I playing, got to it. Yeah. Uh, I hope you got the ice skaters in it. Well, we'll do. This is more of a, okay, just a quick montage. <laughs> it's weird. I couldn't. I couldn't remember the part of the song, and I still don't understand what the fuck she's saying. And that I'm a little bit that was the, the the closing of the first half mm-hmm. after the before would you, the would second be, commercial. Would John Wayne and Frank Sinatra and people like that, Ringo Starr, like show up on the? Everyone showed up on those shows, right? Yeah. Well, we when we did DC Follies. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was life-size puppets of all you know, hundreds and hundreds of stars. But we would have three guests on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had some big people. They would call us, except Sinatra was going to sue us. He hated his puppet. <laughs> yeah. What? Oh, I got a great Sinatra Give story. Yeah. You know, uh, when I did my act, and he was married to Ava Gardner. Mm. I was on tour in Europe. I just closed at the Lido in Paris for a year. Doing the puppet act. Yeah. Oh, I was huge. How does, pa- is this, how does one go about that? Are you talking? Are you singing? Are you no, it's in the all, outfit? All, it's all music. Uh, my act was uh, 18 to 22 minutes long, and uh, no one had ever seen anything like it. It wasn't in a stage. Are you marionetting it? Yeah. They're mm. three feet tall i mean i did i had a stripper in my act that took uh nine pieces of clothing off and not only took them off with her hand but put them down and left them you know the marionette yeah the mar- <laughs> there it is yeah <laughs> I had. You have quite the dexterity yeah, for all yeah. of that. The best part of my act was the music. Yeah. I played the Coconut Grove a zillion times. I played the Greek. The one down on Sunset? Was that Coconut Teasers or Coconut, coconut no, Teasers? No, Coconut Grove. I'm Give sorry. me a break. I have to work coconut at the in Ambassador it. Hotel. You had oh, to, right. You right. had to come on a Tuesday night in a tuxedo. Is there and a Bobby women Kennedy came. Shot? In yeah. evening gowns, mm-hmm. no flip flops. Oh. So, so uh, sorry, Sinatra. Okay, Sinatra. Um, I in my act, just to go back, if you listen to his recording of the Road to Mandalay, there's a huge gong in it. Mm-hmm. Well, my act used to start off with I never allowed an MC, whoever I followed, blackout. And off stage, he would just say, ladies and gentlemen, the unusual artistry of Sid Croft. And I traveled with this huge gong. I own the biggest gong in the world, uh-huh. okay? <laughs> and, and they would hit the gong, and that's the way, and get everybody's attention. It would vibrate through the theater or club, uh-huh. whatever. Okay, so... Anyway, he borrowed it from me because you'll Sinatra hear it, my did. gong, right? And we became friends, and he did, you know, we worked together and all that stuff. And, and when we did DC Follies, he hated the puppet. Mm-hmm. And so his lawyers wanted to sue us. Yeah. <laughs> and so we just took it off. 
Yeah, and it happened a couple of times with other stars. Okay, I'm in, now let's go. I'm in uh, Madrid, and I'm playing in a club called uh, oh, I can't, La, Rex or something like that. And it was the only club in all of Spain that wasn't a whorehouse because all the clubs, it was dictatorship. In order to be a whore, you had to be registered and be in the show. No talent or talent. Yeah, and like so, pink lady. Right. Pink lady. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Ava Gardner, I'm, but this club was classy. Caviar, champagne, violin. But still whores? No, 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 no. Please. All right, sorry. And Ava Gardner was shooting a movie. And she came in every night. It was the only club to go to, mm -hmm. you know, and <clears throat> to see my show. And I'd always sit out at her table. But every night she'd come in with a, a bullfighter, a famous bullfighter. Mm -hmm. And she was married to Sinatra. Right. Sinatra came over make her come home, because he was so in love with Ava Gardner. And I witnessed in that club, the bullfighter, they you know, had a big fight, and the bullfighter just creamed, because Sinatra was skinny little short guy, and just creamed him, he ended up in the hospital. And so- Ava Gardner is one of the best looking people ever on the born. planet yeah in, one in of the real, beauties in real life she must have been yeah oh exquisite hedy lamar ava gardner citrus i mean whoa yeah yeah, yeah. so you witnessed uh sinatra getting punched out by bullfighter <laughs> yes i did how about that <laughs> and in more recent news we have a clip of uh, jeff altman <laughs> Again? <laughs> From yeah. Letterman doing the big beefy butt steak. Good, because I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, don't, I don't know either. I don't know what his <clears throat> bit was, but he did dad pulling the pants up and big beefy butt steak. <clears throat> the, the, my guess is that this is some inside joke from back in their comic days. That that doesn't make any sense to anyone else. It must be Dave is, laughing his, his ass off. Is, they're like, he, the he's nervous. No, Dave's a friend of his. Uh -huh. Dave goes back, uh -huh. and Dave's covering oh. because he would book him all the time, and even later in in Letterman years, when there was no reason at all to book <laughs> Jeff <laughs> Altman, he would have him on because he was an old school wow. comedy store guy. I think I think Dave is nervously sort of okay, laughing it along. over him, he but looks, he would do the butt stay. I'm, that's Why? his. It's not even a punchline. It's yeah. like a catchphrase. At some point, he pulls his pants up and does this big beefy mustache. Now you thought that was part of his act. You didn't yeah, know that well, right. his entire act is talking about big beefy butt steaks. Uh, is there he any more? He just likes how it sounds. He likes the alliteration. Uh, like it's like two hmm. minutes or three minutes later, they they they, they call back. back to does he stand stuff. up, yeah. pull the pants up? Is that his? Why you? Why do you want to show more? Why are you? That's a great question. I, I'm I'm so intrigued by life. Yeah, me too. I oh my god, me too. You know what? Mm. I I tell everybody out there, my whole career. I don't know where I got it from. I've gone left because everybody goes right. Mm. If you go to Maui, which I lived there for eight years, you know. On the way to Hana, that little skinny road, everybody, nobody goes left. They go right and, at the And fork. go left because you're going to find something. My whole career has been like that because I wanted, that's why I'm wearing this shirt. I wanted to be different. I wanted, right, even when I was a little tiny kid, I wanted to get attention because I didn't have it from my mom and dad or I didn't grow up with my brothers. I don't even know Marty. I really don't. But you guys collaborated for well, so many projects. Okay. Because Marty came out here, I lost my assistant who got a better job. What was Marty's field of expertise? A uh, car salesman. <laughs> yeah. Car salesman. Well, He's, every show you did was. Oh, not sorry. Not okay, every show. You know there were a lot of puppets, happened. a lot of big, That's beefy, me. butt <laughs> puppets. <laughs> well, your come on. brother didn't contribute in that. No, he's not a puppeteer. When I went to Europe, he took my old act. 
without even asking me. He Ooh. took it and my old music. My music was awesome. Who was wrote better those than songs? Me. Not songs. It was all music. Henry Mancini. Oh, mm. yeah. ever heard of him? Yeah. yeah. His, uh, his arranger. Wait, so... And my music, the band used to wait for me to come back. It was only all because of my music. It was... It was awesome. So you had Henry Mancini pre-Pink Panther days. And, uh, his and, and arranger, beyond. his arranger, yeah. Um, so wait a minute. How are, how are you with your brother? Is he still alive? Oh, yeah. All right, are yeah. you, you guys speak? Not really, but it's fine. You know, uh, well, I mean... But here's I, what I'm, I'm I, trying to drill down on. I, okay, you can drill down. I don't... I don't like rehashing. I don't like, you know, even when they make movies and a great, great movie, and then they bring it back. And I mean, like our movie that we did with Will Farrell, Lands of the Lost, it, I had nothing to do with it. You know, it was the studio, it was $200 million, it means nothing. Hey, I got, Adam, I got to tell you something. Puffin stuff costs fifty six thousand dollars an episode, and Land of the Lost might have been sixty. And look what you saw on the screen, and and I was haunted by budget constantly, and you know, and I said, hey, creativity is hard to come by, and we both know that. You know, well, for certain, not Jeff Altman. Yes. He came up with big well, that wasn't things. my fucking <laughs> no, idea. I <laughs> Give me a break. I'm curious in the dynamic that you had with your brother, and uh, never it 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 was never friendly. But you know? but so you hear this a lot. There's many acts. You know, I hate Kimmel's guts. Mm -hmm. uh, there's acts famously don't get along right. creatively. No, I it, don't. Yeah, at that, some point. Yeah. But I, for me, it was always Sid and Marty Croft from the mind of Sid and Marty Croft. Sid, Sid you know and Marty why? Croft. Okay, yes. let me stop you for a sec. We're at the Polo Lounge. Les Poupées de Paris was the biggest puppet show ever, ever produced in the world. And it was at the Seattle World's Fair. And it took three months to install the machinery, the stage. There, You know, it was a... Tits and ass. It was for adults only. You had to be 21. That was the gimmick. Oh, what year was this? Uh, 1962, yeah. And In then Seattle, we, did you say? Yeah. Is that when Elvis we, filled, filmed the movie out there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. keep going. And then Les Poupées de Paris played at the New York World's Fair own, in its own theater. Huge, huge. Nine years that show ran. It played a puppet show played to nine and a half million people. But you have to be 21. Okay, you know, I work with Gypsy Rose Lee in burlesque, and, and I love in the Broadway show, you got to have a gimmick. If you want to get a job. You got to have a gimmick, <laughs> You right? got to get, and and, she, one has a trumpet, and one, yeah. yep. Well, I, right from the beginning of my career, you got to have a gimmick for everything that you do. That's... You know, I was a one-man show. I still am. In well, a so way. your brother? My brother does. He's brilliant. Does the business? Uh huh. And and I'm the creative. He's creative too because hey, you learn, don't you? I mean, when you're around, we had we had a horseshoe up our butt because we had the best people wanted to work for us because. I am fucking insane. You know? <laughs> yeah. Grab that. You know. So you were designing, constructing, and doing all the puppet stuff, and yeah. he was driving all the deals. Oh, yeah, yeah. And still, you know. But rehashing, you know, I know I watched uh, a show that you did talking about us because we had Croft the Con, you know. Right, oh, the, yeah. the convention. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. And... Uh, you know, and you weren't even sure if we were going to be there. You think we're rich? That's bullshit. Oh, not rich. No, no. no. Uh, 
Well, wait a minute. That's another story. There, you can. S- I don't do drugs. <clears throat> I never, I never yeah. thought that per se. Yeah. Um, I, I felt like I had done drugs from watching some of your material. <laughs> well, that was that was my deal. But I wanted you. Do we? Hey, you know yes. what? I'm sorry, Adam. Um, I, I started to say earlier on today that little kids. It was for little kids, right? But I knew that adults in those days sat with their kids on Saturday morning. Uh-huh. If an adult laughs and the kid doesn't know what the fuck <laughs> they're laughing at, they're going to laugh with them, right? right? of course. Yeah. And so why did the Beatles order a new... As soon as every show came off the press, they wanted it. Why? They wanted it before it aired. Yeah. And because they were locked in their hotel rooms, they just loved <laughs> Puff and Stuff. you got to play England, the opening to that Okay, one. but Puff and Stuff in England was on at night at 7 o'clock. Ah, because of the, all, because of the star? No, because we were against Bonanza, and oh we took God. the time period. Yeah. <laughs> Because well, the star was, so, was the English kid who oh, played Oliver, yeah, right? Oh, yeah, he was. I saw him in Oliver. I knew Lionel Bart. Who, yeah, it was a very cute, charming. talented little uh, little kid. Wow, you got some great, great engineers in oh, there. Oh, he's the best. This is the, unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, th- you had a band. Oh, yeah, the I boys. I the band. The boys. And, the boy Sharon Baird. One of them was kind of modeled after Mama Cass. Am I right? Well, ma- no, Mama <clears throat> Cass was in the movie. She was my neighbor, and Mama Cass. In what movie? The Puffin Stuff movie. I didn't know there was a Puffin Stuff See, movie. Yeah. You are so out of touch, <laughs> Adam. <know. laughs> what year what the you Puffin don't Stuff know about movie Puffin come Stuff. out? 1970. It was Universal. I wanted. We, we wrote in a new character, Boss Witch, mm-hmm. and I wanted <clears throat> Betty Davis. Mm-hmm. And she had an ad in the trades that she was looking for a job. Betty Davis did. What? Yeah. And so I, I, <laughs> uh, I called her. I got her phone number. I called Mae West. That's, oh, we got to, um, when you're on my show, she was a really good friend of mine. I, I still want to hear about Judy Garland. Okay, oh and Judy Garland. God. I mean, just give me a name and I'll tell you a story. <laughs> okay, I've been around. I've been around since Lincoln was the president. <laughs> I was here. Yeah. Okay, Adam. So, uh, what were we talking you about? You were, you, May, uh, no, not May Betty West. Davis. Ju- Betty Davis. Betty Davis. So, I got her phone number. I called her and I said, you know, we're, we're doing a universal movie, Puff and Stuff. She said, I never heard of it. And she said, uh, what's the part? And I said, Boss Witch. And she said, do you want me to play a witch? Go fuck yourself and hung up. So I wrote her, I hand wrote her a letter, mm-hmm. you know, never heard back from her, you know. And so we ended up with my great, great friend, from back in the early 50s, Martha Ray. Martha Ray. Yeah. Like, and okay. the Vandellas? Who am I talking about? No. Martha oh, okay. Ray. The Martha actor. Ray. Martha no. Ray, the Who comedian. No. You're, you're thinking of... A, a million movies. I gotta see. Martha and the Vandellas. But no. I don't think her last okay. name... No, you're no, thinking of Martha Ray... Was the comedian. F- comedian who was famous from the 70s for doing... Denture adhesive commercials. <laughs> yeah, but no, she was in a lot of movies, big movies. Well, that's how you get the denture. Yeah, they yeah. actually get yeah, the polygrip. Right. Yeah, you know. Martha Ray had a club in Miami. I used to play the Jesus Christ. It, it's such a So let me just say this yeah. in a more surreal. You can find Martha Ray doing oh, she, polygrip or whatever. Here's what happened. Polyden. Martha Polyden. Ray did did uh, Benita Bazaar in the Bugaloos. <laughs> How dare you? Oh, you guys <laughs> must have. Do you guys do the no, the Bugaloos was out of England, right? No, that that's was yours. Not, of but course. weren't they English? Yeah. Okay. We, not that far. Well, because we had such a <laughs> success. So here's with, here's the thing that's weird about life, and uh, we we were all we're all hope. God willing, you'll enter this stage one day. Martha Ray to me is the polydent 
<laughs> spokesperson. <laughs> she's not a celebrated '50s comedian. Right. She's. She, I know a, she was so, she was something. Right. Oh, she's but, huge. Yeah. But she's selling Polydent. Right. And Agnes Moorhead is in Dora from Bewitched, right. not a big star That's right. of, of Broadway. Right. And um, Trotting for, the boards. For, for many, um, Phil Rizzuto worked for the money store. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Brian yeah, reference. Gotcha. We don't know he's an all-star Yankee. Yeah. So. It depends when you're around. That's right. So the problem is you hang around too long, you have to get work, and that comes in polydent and commercials. And that's how we remember you. And then sell you sell no, no, workers. wait a minute. Right. When, I, when I approached her, she said to me, she was, she was a big star. Mar- she has two stars on the Walk of Fame, Yeah, it says here. Okay, Martha Ray, when I approached her, and she was a great friend of mine, when I'd play to the Bartleville Theater in Miami, we'd go out every night. Mm-hmm. And, and Benita Bazaar was really written for Martha Ray in The Bugaloos. Do you remember that? I remember The Bugaloos. The Bugaloos. The Bugaloos. <laughs> We're in, in the, the air, air and everywhere. everywhere. Flying sure. high. Flying free. Nowhere else we'd rather be. The Bugaloos. There was weird English <laughs> uh, b- bumblebee. <laughs> Group, you know Lionel Bart, who wrote Oliver and the script and the music, was also a friend of mine, and that's how I found Jack Wilde, because Lionel Bart called me from England. He's the Oliver guy. Yeah, and which won eleven. <laughs> it won eleven Academy Awards. Yeah, yeah. it's huge. All that, right, so. Judy, oh, wait a minute. You had Mama Cass Elliot. Okay, Mama Cass lives at the bottom of my hill where when I moved into my house, I've been there 50 years, I built it, and she's at the bottom of, very bottom of my hill. After she passed away, uh, uh, Ringo Starr lived there, now um, Beverly (laughs) D'Angelo. And they all became, we all be, we were close neighbors, so we all became friends. But Mom and Cass never made a movie before. And she was handled by, um, oh, God, wait a minute. What was his name? Um, Doesn't matter. No, it's, uh, yeah. It's a big he, name? Yeah. Uh, he was, he produced. Swifty Lazar. No, he produced the, the Academy guy. Awards. Alan, uh, Alan Carr. Alan Carr. Carr yeah, who was married her. to somebody. And I said... Betty White? No. And I wanted... Mama Cass never acted or never did a movie before. But she used to come up to my house every night to have dinner. <laughs> Love the... Even when you weren't there. <laughs> yeah, even when you weren't there. Yeah. Are you, are you done yet? Yeah. So... Take it. You made her cast her as the as, as boss witch. No, a witch Hazel. Oh, I see. The what boss you did there. witch ended up being Martha Ray. Oh, Ray. the great. You got to watch Dent, the right? movie. The movie. If you love acid trips, watch the movie. Is That's there a, a trailer for that movie? Oh yeah. Of All right, course. we, we got to get to Judy Garland oh, before please, we yes. bring this home. Wow, you toured yeah, with Judy. Been, for uh, almost yeah, a year and a half, and the last engagement was at the Fontainebleau in Miami, and that's when Marty joined me as my assistant. And so he would, I gave up my act, that was 1957, and I gave up my act in 1959, after 19 years of doing it, and then Les Poupées de Paris, which really put us on the map. Was Judy Garland <clears throat> difficult? Not with me. I loved, uh, you know, I was very, very close to her. I had my own dressing room. I used to dress with her, you know, because we loved laughing. She loved sick jokes. <laughs> but the only di- difficult thing about Judy Garland is her life was so intense that there, you know, there were shows where she didn't want to perform. That wasn't important to her, and they were, you know, they were not wealthy. Uh, 
that didn't have that much money. And the lived, girl from Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Yeah. But Judy Garland, oh, the best stories. I worked with Liberace. Oh, yeah. For many, many years. I knew him in 1952. That's the best. Was stories. he openly gay in, in the inner circle that everyone know? No. If that movie, I got to tell you, that movie that they made. Behind the Candelabra. Yeah. I wrote a letter to the Times, but it didn't print. And <clears throat> to the editor, that was not Liberace. Of course, he was a hidden, you know, yeah. But Liberace was the coolest, but he lived totally in his own world. If you said, Lee, the queen died, and he said, he wouldn't, you know, well, he knew the queen because we did a command performance. But uh, I'm using the wrong... I'm using the wrong... Uh, Metaphor. Yeah. I, I, but he just... It was about his costumes, his act. He loved the stage. They made him out to be quite the narcissistic egomania. He wasn't at all. You could never question him about things like that. He would sue you. He didn't have a publicist. He was the publicist. He had a manager. He was so brilliant as a performer. Yeah. If, uh, I hope you've chronicled all this in a book somewhere. I'm uh, Right now, I'm doing a documentary, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Where might mm -hmm. we find this documentary when and it's it, completed? Well, as you know, I mean, you wrote many books. It takes, it's a lot of work. Yeah. And it takes a long time. Are you making it for somebody, or are you going to make it on spec? No, as no, say? we're making it for a big company. Yeah. I am, yeah. It's just my life. It's got nothing, very little to do with puffing stuff and all. Because I told you, there's 29 years of the most, I'm still alive, the most incredible stories. Old Hollywood. I played... At Earl Carroll's. I don't know who that is. Okay, across the street from the Palladium, that beautiful building. Mm hmm You know? Yeah, I... I Earl I, Carroll's I, I, Vanities. You know, I worked... Oh, God. You name it. With huge, huge stars all over the world. The stories I have. And you're coming on my show? Yes. To be continued. <laughs> to be continued. All right, well, let me hit this spot. Boy, my head's ringing. Really? <laughs> did I do that? Well, it's, you know, it's, it, the, the story, yes, you did. Because, you know, I, I, I meant to. I, I'm sorry. I, I meant to. I picked up your story in 1975, but uh, I didn't know anything before that. 1940 is when you I started. was performing. 1940 in Va Vaudeville. Is there any? Burlesque. Is there such? Is there any puppet business now? Is that uh, any part of show business? I mean, yeah, besides so crank anchors. Crank anchors on the air. <laughs> what are yeah. you? I mean, are like you live kidding? performance. The Muppet Muppet. Well, I was going to ask. You must have known Jim Henson. Yeah, Marty is the one that told Jim Henson, "Put your name above." Everybody thinks we're the Muppet. <laughs> you know, right? Put your name on it. And just to, in closing, how it came to be, Sid and Marty Croft. It was always Sid Croft, Sid Croft. And then when we put our company together, it was the Croft, uh, Le Poupé de Paris was the Croft Theater mm -hmm. Presents. It was all bullshit, story behind it. Fifth generation, there was nothing like that. <laughs> okay, a, a publicist did all that shit. Okay, so what happened was we're at the Polo Lounge, Le Poupé de Paris just opened at, in the Seattle World's Fair, and uh, Billy Graham came to the opening because it was sponsored by the fair. They paid for it in an unbelievable theater. I had the whole audience on a turntable. Wow. It was unreal before Disney did it, Disneyland. Okay, so anyway, um, Billy Graham... The big thing of Les Poupées de Prix, you're talking about a puppet show, is after this spectacle, it was an hour, we invited the whole audience to come back 
and see the piece of machinery and the girls, the all naked puppets, tits and ass. <laughs> the girls getting dressed, leaving the theater and all. You know, it was just amazing. So we invited Billy Graham, and he stormed out of the theater. First show, opening show. And that night he had a rally, 100,000 people, and he, because Kennedy was supposed to cut the ribbon, but Billy Graham, something happened, Kennedy didn't show up. So Billy Graham said, the, the fair is unbelievable, come from all over the world. Seattle is the most beautiful city. But don't go see a show called Les Poupées de Paris because the women don't wear bras. That's well, the best shit. endorsement oh, you could ever get. Come on, Time Magazine, <laughs> you forget it. You know, boom, we went through the roof. And my Oh, that's my just don't theater, eat Chick-fil-A. Uh, right. That's the modern-day version of that. If you came, I couldn't even get you into my theater because the fair, they held the tickets. Okay, and we did five shows a day. It was always sold out. So anyway, we come back, because I was on Johnny Carson or some show. No. Uh, it, Mike Douglas. No. It, Dinah Shore. No, it was... Uh, uh, what's Pink his Lane, name? Jeff. No, before, before Johnny Carson. Jack Parr. Jack, ba uh, yeah, Jack, Jack Parr. Parr. Yeah. I hate interviews because you don't have time to talk. You have four minutes, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know what do you talk about? And so, so anyway, and thank you for you know. I was looking forward to to a longer I really format was than Jack Barr because <laughs> Adam, I'm li I was like, and you can ask Kelly, who's with me, my assistant, creative assistant, and. Uh, and so I was looking forward to today because I was like an old little kid, you know. Oh, <gasps> my God. What? Yeah. We got, we got I'm to take you on a trip. We got to oh, puff and stuff. Oh, Thank you. This is oh, awesome. Nice. These tie-dyed hoodies. Oh, you no. guys forgot one of the HR puff and stuff. They had, had like angry mushrooms. And on the back, look at the back. Yes. It's yes. my shirt. Yes. On the bottom. All right. <laughs> okay, but okay, this is important before you cut me off the air. No, I mean, Go we're ahead. five minutes over. Go ahead. And we're at the Polo Lounge. Tony Martin and Sid Charisse were like our moms and dads because I toured with Tony. I played Vegas with him and a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, and we're having lunch, and Walt Disney is sitting at the next table. I am pissing in my pants. I never met him, right? And he, Walt Disney gets up and he comes over to say hello to Sid and Tony. Marty and myself are at the table. And, of course, they introduce. He said, oh, yeah, I heard of you guys. I, I'm, I heard about your show in Seattle, and I'm going, but, you know, I'm going to go see it. Can I give you some advice? And we look at each other. Are you Walt Disney? What year? Is this 63, 62? Yeah, he died in 65. So it was like 62, mm -hmm. three, something. I lose track of time. I have senior moments. Okay, mm -hmm. so anyway, uh, he said, always put your name above everything that you create because someday it'll be worth something, <laughs> right? It said the Croft Theater. The world-famous Croft Theater, and it was not world-famous, <laughs> on, on top of the marquee, right? And so my publicist here in L.A., who really made Le Poupée de Paris famous, we, I told him the story, and he said, shit, I, brothers, I can sell that. Brothers are stronger than, you know, the Croft Theater, you know, doesn't mean anything. So he, you know, with Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons, who <laughs> gave us every week, gave us big, but brothers, Sid and Marty Croft, Sid, and so we pounded it into everybody's head. It's good lore. 26 shows, Sid and Marty mm -hmm. Croft, and you know, they repeat the shit out of the shows yeah. on, on kids, you know, over and over, and they grew up, 
go to Comic Con with me. These are adults, <laughs> and they come up. And they come up. I would. I would be. We do a panel. I would be every gang year. raped if I showed yeah. up with you <laughs> really? amongst your fans. Yeah. I would say I would. No, that's attack. what they. They. I would cry. need a lot of security. They, I. I. I need a lot of security. <laughs> they cry and they want to touch you. It. Look at you. That's fifty. You know the. The lyrics? I, I think why? I would know more than lyrics. But why? Why well, did you knock the shit out a, of my show? <laughs> this is a why? Com- it's why? a combination. Well, for me, <laughs> there's a little, uh, I'm on the spectrum of a few different, you know, <laughs> illnesses. <laughs> uh, I oh, grew up in a vacuum, talking, a vacuum of entertainment. Yeah. I did not have eye contact with my family. All I have is, the, I do have a sort of idiot savant memory for song lyrics per se i heard that about you i can pull yeah. out stuff from 50 <laughs> years ago that it could be a pete ellis dodge commercial i can remember the jingle i couldn't sure. remember what but i how read brilliant adam that that's what blows me away <laughs> yes it I was, really I was... did today i mean you knew every single word of all that's what how many shows do you know the lyrics of that is 55 years old all I got is Gilligan's Island. Yeah. Well. I, no, I listen. I your um, your uh, creative endeavors impacted me. Really? Yes. Thank you. That's yes. a big compliment coming from you. Yes. Thank you. So I didn't much. say it was negative or positive. Yeah. I just said it was a very big impact. <laughs> Look, what you what you are and what you created is forever stuck in my head. Now, a lot of people out there. Yes. I, I can picture all these people. I, I can see Charles Nelson Riley right now. He's another one that said to me, Sid, I love you. Don't fuck up my career. He gave us a hard time. Don't make me he, do a kid Charles show. Charles was kind of at the end of, he was heading off the match game and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, but you want to know something? That character, Hoodoo, that was his became his character on Johnny Carson, mm. on all the shows. He was doing hoodoo. You know, that was, he was brilliant. Hated, hated coming to work. <laughs> he called it the Croft, uh, uh, oh, I don't know, Nazi camp or something. Crematory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We'll use alliteration. Sure. Whatever it was. All right, let me hit a quick spot here with uh, concrete. Your body makes half the creatine it needs. The other half comes from your diet, but most American <laughs> diets are low in creatine, rich foods, and that's where concrete comes in. Patented creatine, HCL, is a favorite creatine of elite, well-informed athletes. The number one bioavailable creatine and the only microdose in creatine. Just one small scoop per 100 pounds of your body weight. Shake it up and it has a nice lemony flavor to it. You can feel the energy immediately. Creatine is required for functional energy in every cell, and your brain uses about 20% of the creatine in your body. Your immune system needs it. Your heart needs it. Your lungs, all the cells in your body need it. Dr. Drew loves this stuff, and so do I. It is concrete, right, Dawson? Take control of your health, both body and mind. Build a better you with concrete. Register now at con createcom slash podcast. That's con-cret.com slash podcast. For a chance to win a $500 Walmart Visa gift card available now online and in-store at Walmart, concrete is truly life-changing and performance-enhancing. What well, we the didn't, fuck? Well, we, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even get to Electra Woman and Dyna Girl. Oh, my followed God. Followed a, a, a few short years later by the... Patty LaBelle show. That's wow. A, hey, Adam. A lot of range. Would you have me back? I would oh have you back. God. I love doing this. Guest of the year is done. We what Everyone the, oh else go God, home. My oh. favorite shirt. This hoodie is the best. Thank Sid, you. I will be happy to come on your show, which you, is uh, Sundays with Sid. At 3 o'clock. You at can 3 o'clock. do it from your home. Pacific time every yeah. Sunday and on Instagram at, at Sid Adam. Croft. Yes. You got, where do you live? I live in La Cunada, California, and sometimes Malibu. I'll make it to your house. 
you got to come. I built my house. Oh, I, I love, I gotta love it. You got to give it a once over. Yes. I, you know, I have a tree house. You be prepared, though. I can, yeah. cri- I can critique. I don't know if you know that side of me, but no. sometimes I'm judgmental about people's I love art. it. All I right. love it. I love All right. well, this people is People uh, are afraid to do that for some reason. And, and I, no, I like the truth. Years in the making, Sid Croft, everyone. Thank, thank you. you, and I will and see you on you. your show. You can go to adamcurl.com for all the live shows. Until next time, it's Adam Curl for Sid Croft, Gina Grant, and Bob Ryan. Say it. Mahalo. Mahalo.